Uh, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the venerable but vibey British Library for this very special literary salon celebrating the incomparable, enigmatic Miss Jane Marple. And beneath your feet are copies of every single Agatha Christie novel, not just copies, but the very, very first editions, some scribbled in by herself. So just feel that Agatha energy surging up through your feet this evening and enjoy. I have chosen an arsenic green tie, especially for the occasion, as did the head of the British Library without consulting me, also wearing the arsenic green tie. He will discover that his tie is poisoned by the end of the event. So anyway, in a minute, you're going to be, I'm going to be joined by three very special guests. Before we begin, please make sure that your phones are switched off or there will be a murder in the library. Oh. <laughs> let you do that. It's always so much more satisfying when Scottish people say murder. <laughs> much more fatal, murder in the library. So tonight is the much postponed, long awaited official return of Miss Marple in the brand new collection of 12 original tales by some of the world's finest writers, including Naomi Alderman, Jean Kwok and Natalie Haynes. And you can find more appearances from Naomi and Natalie on the Salon podcast. Each gripping new story takes inspiration from Christie's classic novels and presents our beloved sleuth with a brand new mystery to solve. And as ever, Miss Marple knows much more than she appears to. Jane Marple, as many of you will know, was first introduced to readers in 1927 in the short story. Can anybody shout the title out before I read it? The... Oh, you're not as good, you're not as hot as I thought you were. The Tuesday Night Club. Uh, she made her first appearance in a full-length novel in 1930s, The Murder at the Vicarage, and she went on to appear in 12 novels and 20 short stories, and she never aged a day. <laughs> I want to know about her moisturiser. That is really what I want to know about. She was supposedly based on Christie's grandmother and on her grandmother's friends, although Christie wrote later on that uh, Miss Marple was far more fussy and spinsterish than my grandmother ever was. It's nearly half a century since Miss Marple's last outing in fiction. That was the novel published in 1976. So this collection is very welcome. Um, and as I say, she's no older, she's just as wise. Crime, more than any other genre, reflects the world that it's published into. It reflects the world of the moment, events of the day, preoccupations and prejudices. And the world has changed a lot since Miss Marple last appeared in 1976. And crime fiction has changed with it. And partly because of it, because Marple was such a pioneer, as was Christie. And the character of Marple evolves across the novels um, just as she's interpreted differently by each of the actresses who have played her. But the human heart remains the same. It has the same capacity for dark deeds. It has the same capacity for lightness. So we meet this icon again, but she's somehow fresh. In the new collection, she spends a lot of time solving crime in Sussex. I live in Sussex. There is not that much crime there. Honestly, it's a safe place to visit, um, but I do notice there's more of it in East Sussex than in West Sussex. Anyway, <laughs> she, she takes tea at various vicarages. In a bid to get away from it all, she escapes to America in the brilliantly titled Miss Marple Takes Manhattan. Absolutely brilliant title. That's a story by Elisa Cole. And she seeks sun on the Amalfi Coast in Murder at the Villa Rosa by Ellie Griffiths. As always, we meet her very good friends who are a beat behind, shall we say, um, and her artistic nephew, Raymond, who's doing very well with his novels, one of them is being adapted on Broadway. And she goes to stay with various school friends, some more murderous than others. And there is, of course, a fatally festive Christmas. Wherever she goes, she takes a wee bag of knitting and a tangle of suspicion, and there may also be one or two or three snifters of cherry brandy. So tonight, all you Marple superfans will have the chance to win a bundle of prizes. I'm going to read out what they are. We've got a full set of the reissued novels from HarperCollins, so get yourself a new shelf, a gorgeous, silky Queen of Crime cushion designed by Karen Mayburn, and a jigsaw, which I have tried to do. It is so fiendish, I'm not sure she could actually finish it. Um, it's got about a million pieces in it, so it will see you through the winter. So we've got a bundle of those for you in, here in the room to win, and a bundle for people online to win as well. And all you have to do to enter is ask a question. Could it be any easier? That's not a comment. 
I will murder you for a comment. You can ask a question um, and be picked. So um, an extra warm welcome to you if this is your first literary salon. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, I've been hosting salons since 2008, and I know that there are some people here tonight who've been to most of them. In 2019, we added salons online so that you can join us at home in your jammies. You might be in your jammies. You might be dressed like for a cocktail party at the Vicarage or a combination of the both. Um, I did an event earlier this year, and Annie Lennox was at it. Absolutely stunning. She was on Zoom, and there she was, the hair, the makeup, a pussy bow blouse. She was accepting an honor, and I was just like, oh my God, it's Annie Lennox. And when it was her turn to leave, she closed her laptop, and she didn't realize the camera was going to go down with the top of the, the computer. Um, and we saw that she was wearing fluffy cow print pajama pants <laughs> and some lovely mules. Um, and I just loved it even more for that, actually. So anyway, past salon guests include this year, Douglas Stewart, Dolly Alderton, Maggie O'Farrell, Jojo Moyes, and Satnam Sangera. And you can catch them all on our podcast and on our YouTube channel. Tonight's hashtag is Marple. If you're tweeting, it's also Lit Salon. Uh, now, before I welcome my guests, some Marple super fans wanted to share the love. Roll VT. I used to live in a tiny little village in Northamptonshire on a big estate, and one of my neighbours rejoiced in the name of Nancy Brains. Nancy was retired, had been in service at the big house, her husband had worked on the estate, and the little cottage overlooked the brook and the one street in the village, about 200 souls. And Nancy would sit out on a bench and without much commentary or obvious interest, just noted the comings and goings of people every day. The disruption to the pattern, a tiny little kink in what you expected. And from that, she had the most extraordinary ability to see into the reality of people's lives, who they were and what they did. And I often think of her when I do, I think of Jane Marple with her beady eye on the street of St Mary Mead. Gritty realism. Hi, I'm Jean Kwok, and I wrote a story from Marple called The Jade Empress in which Miss Marple goes on a cruise to Hong Kong and first one victim falls, then another, until it's clear there's a murderer on board and no one can get off the ship. I'm a first generation immigrant and so I grew up in an insular world. My family was old fashioned and very little penetrated that bubble around us, but Agatha Christie was someone who somehow transcended that barrier of culture and language. So when I was trying to learn English, I naturally turned to Agatha Christie's books and I loved them. When I was approached for this project, I was very honored. To have the opportunity to bring Miss Marple into an Asian world was very meaningful to me. Hi, I'm Ruth Ware. I was so honoured to be asked to contribute a story to the Marple Anthology. To me, Agatha Christie is the queen of plotting and that satisfying moment at the end of every one of her books where the pieces click into place and all those little extraneous details that you thought were just scene building are revealed to be essential clues to solving the mystery is just the purest kind of reading pleasure I know. And it's what I strive to do at the end of my own books. And it's the pleasure that I try to give uh, in my Miss Marple story, uh, Miss Marple's Christmas. Responsible for murderous tinsel. Um, so we were going to be joined tonight by James Pritchard, who is the great grandson of Agatha Christie and CEO of the Agatha Christie Estates. But James is not well. Um, however, we have an extra guest who is going to be joining us. Um, her name is Ella Bertou. She is a bibliotherapist and the author of the novel Cure. She's also the salons in house bibliotherapist. So she's going to join us in a moment, talking about the joys of reading mystery and of cozy crime. So in order, my guests are literary goddess and creator of the Women's Prize, Kate Moss. The fiendishly brilliant, mega best-selling Christie superfan, Lucy Foley. And Eliber too. Right then. It's very lovely to have you all here. Got my gramophone at the ready. Should we feel the need for a Charleston? Um, Kate, you're going to give us a reading, 
from apparently. your story, apparently, um, which is the mystery of the acid soil. Story set in Sussex, a place you know well. Obviously. Well, what we've just discovered is that we all live in Sussex, <laughs> um, quite close to each other, so yeah. we think we should be in Horsham. <laughs> Yeah. This evening, right rather than in London. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, I'll just get the British Library yeah, yeah. to move to Horsham. Exactly, to move to Horsham. <laughs> I'm sure that that will um, be fine. So we couldn't hear anything you were saying back then. It was all flattering. So I'm sure it was fantastic. Um, so I don't know if you it said what we were asked to do or anything no. about it. No, I haven't given them any of the stories of the rules or the setup okay. or anything like that. They just know that you're going to read them from, from your short story. So you don't want me to do song. any of that now, you want me to read this story? Just, just read right. the story. Okay. Just read the story, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> it's why you're here, just read the story. Read the story. Read and the then we'll chat story. about it. Uh, yeah, so um, my story, however, <laughs> um, is set <laughs> um, after the end of the Second World War and um, at a moment that was a kind of tipping point in English village life, mm. which was that we all look back, and of course we're all fighting for this now, about how important the NHS was and how everybody would assume that it was a brilliant thing. But actually, within every small village and community, there were people who felt it was not a good thing, mm. and many of those people were doctors. And I just thought that that moment of change, really big social change, would be quite fun to write a story. So my story is set in Fishbourne in Chichester in sort of 1948-1949. And I am... Where am I going to read from? So, you know the page reference I was given? 320. Yeah, that turns out to be for the proof, not the book. Oh. Okay. Um, but that doesn't matter, really, because I'm just going to read um, a little bit from here okay. instead. Lovely. Um, so all you need to know that Miss Marple has gone to stay with her friend Emmeline Strickert. And Emmeline Strickert was a girl uh, with Carrie Louise and Ruth that some of you will know from that particular Marple novel. And so I gave her an extra friend. And it's clear that something is going rather wrong um, there. Three quarters of an hour later, Miss Marple and Emmeline were standing outside the bull's head on the main road in Fishbourne. The early morning clouds had burnt off and the sun was now quite fierce in an intense blue sky. Miss Marple's face was sombre. Are we any further along, Jane? Oh, I think so. After all, cases such as this are almost always the same. I know in books it is generally the most unlikely person, but I never find that rule applies in real life, except, except, except it seems to me there is more to it. Miss Marple frowned. It's the sequence of things all running together. There being two glasses and Mrs. Hands being dismissed from Cooper's service. Emmeline's eyes were bright. And what do you think? That Dr. Barden understood he had made a terrible mistake and regretted it, and Cooper realized. I can't begin to say I understand, but it really is most exciting. Miss Marple's expression grew even more grave. No, Emmy, murder isn't a thing to be taken lightly. Murder? Emmeline wailed. Do you mean to say that Dr. Barden was murdered? Oh, I think so. Emmeline's eyes grew wide. Shouldn't we tell someone? Hmm. Having a suspicion is not the same as proof, Miss Marple glanced at her wristwatch. I wonder if the rector would forgive us for calling on him a little earlier than usual. Emmeline opened her mouth, then closed it again. I will see if Williams might drive us. He's by way of being the informal village taxi service. It's quite a step from here to the rectory. She turned to knock on the door of a second cottage in the same row. Oh, I've remembered. It was Williams who had the argument with Dr. Barden. So much the better, mm. said Miss Marple, with a gleam in her sharp, blue eyes. <laughs> <laughs> that was so not the bit I was going to read. But read it very yeah. well. There we go. Well. It's completely we've inexplicable who the characters were. But we've got we go. all the ingredients. We've got a, we've got a vicarage. We've got faith, yep. faithful servants. Yep. Um, class tension. All of the kind of key, you know, key backgrounds elements for things to spark into life. Was that all there for you when you got the call 
Did you think, that's, that's where I'm going to do it? No, I, th I think for me it was, and, I, and I, I, I'm sure Lucy feels the same, and we've, we've all done a few events with some of the other Marpolites, as we think of ourselves, and I think everybody felt an enormous sense of responsibility that all of you and all of us love Miss Marple and we admire Agatha Christie, the biggest selling author in world history. Yes. Um, you know, just extraordinary. So, and we were given quite tight guidelines, which we'll, we'll come back to. But I think it was the sense of how could we write um, a true version of Christie's Miss Marple mm. that would also feel plausible and new and interesting. Yeah. And for me, I went back, I think we all did this, didn't we? We, uh, you know, we all lay around on sofas eating chocolates, rereading all the 12 novels and all the short stories and saying, <laughs> this is work, I'm working. Um, but I found in several of the short stories, I was looking for clues. There's a, there are many clues to who Miss Marple is in the novels and particularly the short stories. Mm. So I discovered that Miss Marple had an uncle who was canon at Chichester Cathedral. Many of you will know that I live outside Chichester and it's my hometown. And so I thought, ah, so she could absolutely know that part of the world. Mm. Uh, I then, with a couple of the stories, there are two occasions where she does not act. And because she does not act, somebody dies. You mean because she doesn't take action, because she's That's not right. decisive? Yeah. So I felt the Miss Marple that Christy uh, created would never have forgiven herself for that. Mm. Her conscience for not having prevented a murder would be very significant. And so that was really the driving force for my story, The Mystery of the Acid Soil, was the idea that she was saying, I remember the time when I didn't do this. What, what was the case that, she, that you cite in the story? Was it, was it a, a spa hotel or somewhere like that? Yes, it was a spa hotel where there's a lovely, uh, you know, a, a, uh, you know, good fellow, well met, you know, that kind of chap. Yeah. And a, a woman, and she's gone off shopping, and it's just before Christmas. And I can't remember the name of the story, which I should have obviously <laughs> looked up. Um, but, but it's the one where the key um, clue, really, is that the hat doesn't fit on the head of the woman who's lying dead in the room. And right. some of you will remember that. It's one of, the, one of those early short stories. And it was exactly that idea of a man who is very plausible. Mm and who is terribly friendly, and his wife is a bit annoying and nobody really likes her very much. And Jane Marple kind of falls for that. Mm. She's annoying, the woman is annoying. But at the same time, she knows that, of course, the man can't be trusted. And we know that she's always comparing everybody to somebody she knows in St. Mary Mead. Mm. Um, and so she, she has all of those, that, that idea that we all know to be true, that big city, tiny village, people are very much the same. Mm. You know, you can, you can spot a wrong one. And so I liked the idea, my story is, nobody knows there's been a crime. Mm. And I also, because I'm that girl that always did her homework, I took the, you know, one of the rules seriously about it would be lovely if there was a gardening theme. Yes. And so I thought, well, obviously, there has to be a gardening theme. Um, even and you're not a natural gardener. I am. I sit in my garden, uh, which my husband and my mother-in-law in the old days looked after, and drink wine. Yeah. Um, I'm not a That's gardener. gardening. Um, That's I, gardening. I am terrific That's in the garden <laughs> from that point of view. Um, under a tree, like, you know, it's a um, Chardonnay gardener. A Chardonnay gardener. Well, a Sav Blanc. A Sav Blanc gardener. No, no, you can't say that after trust after anymore. After trust. No, no, now we know no, that that no, was her exactly. tipple. Um, anyway, so the point was that I thought that that would be very enjoyable as well. But it, w it was very much that idea of why I think Miss Marple matters so much, that she is one of those very rare older women in literature who is there on her own terms. Mm. She's not there as somebody's mother or wife or girlfriend. Uh, she is happy as herself. Mm. She has a very clear moral code and she has that thing that all older women know, that you become invisible. And she uses that as a way of being this dynamic, um, Nemesis, as we of course know, the last uh, written Marple novel, although not the last published Marple novel. And so I wanted her to be active. Mm -hmm. uh, there are all sorts of things that are so interesting, partly from the television. Um, Joan Hickson is my television Marple, and everybody has their own television Marple. 
But in fact, when you read all the books and you go back to them, she's tall. Mm. And I never, you know, I don't I think, think of marvelous. Of tall. But she's described always as tall. Mm. And she's, um, the first time she appears, she's my age. 28? Yes. <laughs> 29. 29. Yeah. But, but that's also really interesting, isn't it? Her the age idea. changes. Because uh, in, 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 a, in a later novel, she's, she's not far off 90 at one point. Well, I mean, she, she does age within the novels. And of course, the one that kind of kicks it slightly out of the park is my favorite Marple, which is Sleeping Murder, which was written during the Second World War. She wrote a Marple and a Poirot in case something happened to her uh -huh. and she couldn't close her character. So she wrote Curtain. I didn't know that. She wrote Curtain for Poirot mm. and she wrote Sleeping Murder for Marple. In case she died. In case she died world. and couldn't close it for her character. Uh, I, I love that she was thinking that that would be our greatest worry. <laughs> you know, it's like the world has ended. Actually, but it's right though. We, we, you no, look for that comfort. It would have been devastating. Know, and that's why Sleeping Murder is out of sequence. Ah, and so it, it's that. set in the 30s and it's actually the most brilliant um, recovered memory yeah. story. I mean, well before the times that that was, you know. But Nemesis is the last one, so she's, you know, she's old and creaky in Nemesis. But in other earlier ones, she physically stops the murderer, mm. not just because she's sitting there in the corner knitting. Mm. And the Marple that we meet in the very first novel is not the Marple we meet in the second novel. No. That's the thing. She'd realized that, that Miss Marple was somebody. Yeah. Um, so she's part of what the, she calls the old pussies. And she's a little bit more like that and slightly gossipy. And then when she reappears in the next Marple novel, which is quite a few years later, she's a more purposeful, dynamic hero than she was. Lucy, who's your favorite Telly Marple? Geraldine McEwen, yeah. controversially. Ooh. I love her. I just think she's got that. You talked about the gleam in her blue eyes. I think she's got that and twinkle. She's tall. Is she tall? Well, she seems, she projects she tallness. I always think of Geraldine McEwen as being towering. There's a like sort that. of sprightliness about her. Yeah. And um, yeah, just a magic that I sort of see in, in my Marple. And she's quite dynamic, yeah. you know. Um, so yeah, she's She's got a lot about her. Ella, who's yeah. your favorite? I love Geraldine as well, actually. Oh, yeah. dear. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone loves her. Most people love Jane. Oh, I don't know yeah. why I asked you. Hands yeah. up for Geraldine McEwen. A fair few Geraldine, <laughs> Geraldine herself put her hand up at the back. Hands, <laughs> hands up for Joan Hicks. Oh, oh lots. Yep. Thank you. Oh, yeah, Joan's very popular. I'm just going to say mine's Angela Lansbury. Oh, I love yeah. her and everything, but yeah. Angela Lansbury, anybody? No, it's just, 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 just we'll all hang, we'll have drinks later. We'll, we'll do that later. <laughs> I think Joan wins the day there. Yeah. Um, uh, so just go back to your story. You mentioned there about the NHS. That's that, that, this was an aspect of the story, and lots of them, as I said at the beginning, crime brings in contemporary history more, I think, than any other sort of genre fiction. Yeah. Um, and you've chosen the NHS. You know, anti-Semitism is a subject of, an, of another story, partly. Um, I did not realise at the time that doctors were so resistant to the setting up of yeah, the yeah. service, and that actually there was this idea that people, would, people wouldn't trust the NHS Wait for it, because they weren't paying for it. No, no, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and also, I think that there'd been, there's so much, you know, I would say one of the great uh, post-Second World War novels, obviously I would say this, is Andrea Levy's Small Island. Mm. And the, the fact, consequences, obviously my wonderful parents are both gone now, but Granny Rosie, who I care for, is still very much around. And all the focus is always on those years of the war. Mm. But in a way, the biggest seismic shift in society was at home after the war had finished, with rationing and, you know, that, you know, that famous line uh, when Churchill was voted out, where the masters now, mm. and the sense that all of society was blowing up. Now, I, I don't know if anybody feels they could imagine what that would feel like. <laughs> um, but, you know, that, that kind of, that tipping point. Yeah. But also that's where Miss Marple and, you know, the friend I've invented for Emmeline Strickett yeah. are so important because they are the anchoring of the old world to the yeah. present and potentially the future. Mm. And so I wanted to, you know, my, my story is, is a very much old fashioned Agatha Christie short story. It's yes. a long short story. I, sorry, Anna. You know, we were given Anna a is word her length. Um, yeah. And obviously, mine was, you know, not as short as it might have been. Uh, but it was exactly that sense of, okay, what would someone like Miss Marple be feeling at this moment? Mm. Because we jump with Marple. 
No, we have the, the, you know, the first novel, and then we jump you know, 10 years before we get the next one. Mm. And a lot of them are in the 50s and 60s and beyond. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's one of the reasons I love Sleeping Murder so much, because it's before the war, and I think there's still that kind of texture of mm. that type of England. Is it in your story, or is it your story, where you refer to her as a late Victorian? She refers to herself as a late well, I Victorian. Do, yeah. I didn't remember that from the original uh, original novels, but I went back and it is, it is, it it's is there. there. She is. Yeah, she's yeah. There. Yeah. It's very much part of her identity, I think. And, you know, my story, she's got her smelling salts, you know, yes. very Victorian. Sal volatile. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah, she no, carries it, them with yeah. her. Yeah, and, and also I think that um, she was the last generation. Miss who, Marple. Miss Marple. Yeah. Who believed absolutely that their vision of the world was the vision of the world, mm. that there wasn't any ambivalence, there wasn't any doubt. Mm. Um, and that, of course, is what you need in a, um, in a I would say, an old-fashioned detective story, which is that there is a moral code, mm. that it's wrong to murder, um, and that you, um, however unpopular it makes you, 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 you stand up and be counted. Mm. And so in mine, I liked the idea that um, nobody believed there'd been a murder, and they certainly didn't believe there'd been two murders. And now the goal was to prevent a second murder. And all the way through all of Christie, not just Marple, but very particularly Marple, doctors are very key. Um, you know, they, they always appear. The church is very key. Yeah. Um, and, you know, there's another mention of, uh, you know, her sister has been down in Sussex. So I just thought, well, I'm going to put my Miss Marple in my home Yeah. and see how she gets on. It's an absolutely terrific story. I enjoyed it so much. Um, and I want to ask you about the rules, actually, I asked both of you about, about the rules. What rules were you given about what you could do with Miss Jane Marple in your, in your story? Well, we were given, I think, really, mostly really sensible rules. Yeah. yeah. So you don't have to say that just because you're editors. <laughs> no, 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 no. But actually, I'm afraid. <laughs> yes. Um, but I, it's not entirely come from the editor. It's kind of possibly come from the Agatha Christie estate. But uh, the first one was that R. Jane Marple could only exist within the time periods mm. that she exists in Christie. And I think that was a really good rule. So you couldn't write young Marple That's at right. school. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay. And I or, think, or a modern Miss Marple. Or a modern Miss Marple, you know, time perhaps. Miss Marple 2022. Yeah, yeah. 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 Miss Marple at the rave. You know, we couldn't do that. Um, <laughs> Enough to see it. With, with her smelling salts. <laughs> yeah, Passing the that. smelling salts around. <laughs> get a load of this. Smelling, get a load of this. Sending a text going, I'm on the train. No, we couldn't do that. Uh, couldn't do She'd that. She'd be great at texting Miss Marple. She'd be really, <laughs> she her text messages would be it. brilliant. Can you imagine? I it would be very arch. Yeah, it'd be very arch. And I would actually, I would love to see what Agatha Christie would do with sort of modern technology because she was right at the forefront of, sort yes. of forensics, everything. You know, she knew her stuff. So I yeah. think she'd have a lot of fun with sort of messages and email and, yeah. you know, air tags and all of that. Um, You'd totally be on panels with her now, the two of you on those gorgeous crime panels talking about it. I can imagine that. that. I can though. see it. No, she wouldn't have enjoyed she wouldn't it. Have wanted to do it. No, she wouldn't and then it. other ones we had. Do you want to say some of the other rules? Um, no romantic interests. Yeah, which, which again, I really agree total with. Total sense. Because Is there a whiff of any romantic interest no. ever? No, in any no. Books ever? And I, I think Agatha Christie was very clear that that was not what she wanted to do because really prior to Miss Marple, every sort of female detective tended to be sort of young, Mm. And there was always a romantic interest, sort of, um, I think even Dorothy L. Sayers, um, you know, there was, there was a romantic interest hanging around. Harriet Vane. Um, Harriet Vane, yeah. exactly. Um, so I think she was very clear that she didn't want it to be complicated by that because it's about her. Right. It's not about her in relation to a, to a man. And also the idea that her character and purpose is not because the person she loved died in the war. No. Mm. It is because that's who she is. So we do know from the novels and short stories that there were one or two uh, gentlemen she quite liked when she was younger. Yeah. Because there's a reference in one of the stories to, um, you know, she, uh, her father put an end to this and she cried for a day or some, you know, something right. like that. But I thought that was a great one as well. And that's actually one thing that, you know, I love the TV adaptations, all of them, but there's, that's one thing that slightly irritates me because I think in one of them, certainly in the G Geraldine McEwen ones, they 
they have this sort of backstory and this love interest and all mm -hmm. of that. And it's sort of, and I think that's almost in the first one. And that sort of puts her in the context of this mm -hmm. sort of failed or lost yeah, love. Yeah, yeah, totally. And it's so unnecessary. As if she can't it's be exist independently yeah, no, of either right. grief or yeah. love, which yeah, yeah. are two sides of the same could just be an independent person. person. Yeah. Yeah. And then we weren't allowed to have her meet Poirot. Yes. Oh, she wasn't allowed to meet no, Poirot. They, they couldn't Not even that. like glancingly no. at Victoria Station. No. <laughs> Quite no. tempting. No Poirot. Well, apparently, Agatha Christie said they would never meet, she would never have them meet because Hercule Poirot was such an egoist, he would hate being taught his job by an elderly woman. Um, she, I think she'd grown to really kind of loathe him at yeah. that stage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, that, that's what's interesting is, in a way, there's more of Christie in Ariadne Oliver than any of the other characters. Mm. You know, who's always dropping her apples and it is furious yeah. with her detective, the Finn, that she's never been to Finland and now she's stuck mm. with him. Yeah. Um, so that was it. And the, the last one was the thing about gardening, which almost everybody else ignored. Oh, well, <laughs> well, there is, there is. I'm, I'm trying to think. There is, a, there is a bit of gardening in one of the other stories. Your car, your Miss Marple goes somewhere to visit a garden, does she not? She Calling has. To, she goes to visit stage, some Japanese she's maples. She's gone to visit the Japanese maples, and there's a sort of something about um, the flowers that used to be dyed for hats. And yes. Sort of poison. So it's, a, it's a bit tangential, but it's there. <laughs> I promise. Google is your friend when yes. it comes to. Uh -huh. You just need to be listening to Gardener's Question Time or become a, a Sauvignon Blanc gardener, yeah. like yeah, a. Too many poisons. In the so garden. those were the only <laughs> limitations. That you've yeah, given. so not much. That's not much, actually. No, no. So if you didn't have limitations, what what would you do? I'd have her meet Mar um, meet Poirot. Yeah. And show him a thing or two. I think it'd be such fun because he'd mm. hate it. You can just imagine it. Yeah. Um. So that'd be great. Yeah. Mm. What about you? I would have really loved to have written her first World War story. Right. Mm. Because she's you know when we meet her. She's in her 60s, possibly beginning of 60s, possibly later. It's never quite clear, mm. um, but that's a long time. So we have lots of clues about where she went to school and her happy family life. finishing life. school. Yeah, and you know, all of that. And that's where I've given her Emmeline Strickert. And I, you know, I use, um, uh, you know, they do it with mirrors, you know, that those two American sisters and added Emmeline into that. But the th for her to have the character that she has and the principle that she has and the courage she has, mm. because at any moment, if she's faced with somebody who has murdered other people, she steps up. Mm. Now that is courageous. I always find that terrifying. I'm always genuinely fearful that she's yeah, no. going to be mm. umped off by the end of yeah, the story. And there are moments in this book where you really think no, no, that's, that's right. about to happen. And I, I would say, you know, one of the great scenes in that is, is in A Murder is Announced, which I think is another one of the great marbles. Mm. Um, when, you know, she, she actually confront the, the mm. murderer doing murder, mm. yeah. essentially, and, and stops it. So I would have loved to have written her in the First World War. Would that be a novel, a novella? A novel, yeah. Yeah, a novel. Yeah. Do it, yeah. do mm. it. Yeah. Unauthorised <laughs> by the Christie <laughs> estate. However, Harper Collins would be thrilled. <laughs> yeah. Miss Harple. <laughs> yes. 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 Miss Joan Harple. Harple. Yeah, Miss Joan, Joan Carple. Yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly, no, I could say When that. you read it, you heard it here first, ladies <laughs> and gents. <laughs> I had this conversation with Ian Rankin recently about Rebus um, and, and um, Rebus's story in Northern Ireland, you know, where he was, a, yeah. where he was you know, in the military before he was a police officer. And, um, and it's all there in that first novel. And yeah. I, th I think it's, is it Notch and Crosses or Black and Blue? I can't remember what the first novel's called, but um, it's, you know, it's, all, it's all sort of there. And I said, you know, do you never, do you never want to write it? And he said, no, I, I would like somebody else to write it, but when I'm dead. Oh, really? Um, yeah. yeah. So don't go bumping them off just so that you can write <laughs> Young Rebus. But I thought that was really interesting that, you know, he, he didn't sort of, I think that's what he said, he didn't want to... Well, out, I mean, in, in a way, the thing is, we all start with our own characters um, at the moment that we have the story to tell. Mm. And what I've learned over all these years is that often readers have not, not a closer attachment to your characters, but in a way have built them a much bigger story that sometimes mm. you have. So Joanna Trollope once said to me, she said, no, the thing for me, Kate, is writing a novel is like um, standing on a railway station, uh, the train comes in, you get into the carriage, you spend the duration of your journey in the carriage with those people, then you get off and the train goes on without you. 
Mm. And I thought that was a beautiful description that's yeah, that's of really how it really feels to write a novel. Yeah. Because often people say to me, oh, can't you write on this story of these yeah. characters? Or, and I think, no, the, the story that I was going to tell about them, I've told. Mm. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, I feel the same, exactly the same way. I feel exactly the same way. I don't want to. I ended it there for a reason, yeah. mm. uh, for whatever reason, for me or for them. And I don't want to go back there. And I always find it interesting when people have this imagination. Uh, they've got a life for your characters or a story or an after, sometimes quite long, you know, or they've written yeah. a story themselves. And uh, it's very flattering, but it's like, I, I can't do that. You, no, no. That's for you to do. You know, it's the, the gift that you mm. give them. But it's probably, I mean, it's probably one of my favorite things about being an author, though, that these people that have lived inside your head, you know, these creations yeah. suddenly people are talking about them as though they're real people and they believe in them as well it's just wonderful you know it's yeah. something magical that happens they sort yeah. of transcend the page yeah no that it is incredible when that happens it is incredibly incredibly flattering um ella i want to ask you our in-house bibliotherapist um so ella prescribes fiction and non-fiction but mainly fiction for life's eos is the author of a book called the novel cure possibly one of the best titles ever <laughs> um, and how often do you prescribe Christy or Marple, and, and what for? Very frequently is the answer. Um, though, in a way, it's something that I tend to prescribe in passing because it, she's so well known that mm. when I do prescriptions for clients, then I'm normally trying to give them more obscure authors, people that they wouldn't th have thought of reading themselves. But I will always say, as I'm having a bibliotherapy session, of course, you need to read some Agatha Christie just for pure escapism or um, because if you're having a reading rut mm. and you haven't been able to read for a while, Agatha Christie is your mm. perfect mm. writer to get back into reading. And I've had so many conversations with clients around the world, Hong Kong, Sydney, New York, who have spent their last few years reading only Agatha Christie, such as women who've been breastfeeding through the night, and the only thing that they could read at that time was Agatha Christie, because that mm. was what kept them going between mm. the early hours of mm. two and five. Um, also, menopausal women, I think, particularly benefit from Miss Marple, because, as you say, she's one of those few women yeah. who actually are um, invisible yet doing something mm. deeply important mm. and amazing. And there's so few great books for menopausal mm. women out there. And it's one of the questions I get most frequently from clients is, really? where are all the books for menopausal women? I, you know, I want to read some interesting books uh, that relate to me once I've had kids and done my career or whatever. And um, there aren't that many books necessarily mm. out there, but Miss Marple is a great inspiration. And of course, lots of people um, learn English through Agatha Christie. Yes. Very true, yes. I think she's... Particularly in India. I mean, apparently, that, it's just kind of the first thing that people start to read. Well, yes, if not Harry Potter. Ah, uh, yeah, maybe, the, yeah. <laughs> well, the wonderful um, Jean Kwok, who wrote one yeah. of the stories um, for the collection uh, told me she she learned English yeah, that's right from Agatha reading Christie. Agatha Christie because yeah. um, she was first generation Chinese immigrant to the States and she would literally sit on the train or sit in her family's business and kind of sit there with a with a with an Agatha Christie. You'd have such, a particular, such a particular way of speaking, a particular yeah, yeah. Yes, vocabulary, yeah, yeah. wouldn't you? So proper. You'd, you'd yeah. know exactly how to behave at a Christmas drinks party yes. in any part of yes. East or West Sussex. And you yeah. know a lot about poison. Yeah, I know a lot yeah. about poison, yeah. which of course she knew because she about. worked, you know, yeah. in, 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 in the, in, during the war. I mean, it's incredible. No, I didn't know that about the learning English thing, but the British Council do recommend, or did yeah. recommend, Agatha Christie books. It's sort of like cultural soft power. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> So, Ella, just going back to the, the bibliotherapy, why is it that, that you think people derive such pleasure and are so kind of invested in these books? I think she did invent archetypes um, of particular characters within her novels mm. who still exist in our minds in so many future detective novels. So there's... Um, not just the great detectives, Marple and Poirot, but also the characters within the often big British country houses, but kind of the dastardly aristocrat, mm. um, 
the um, slightly potentially the, the very loyal servant and then maybe the um, very disloyal nephew, etc. There's all these kind of great archetypes and we love those archetypes yeah. and we just we love that kind of certainty, as Kate was saying earlier, about the morality, mm. which eventually mm. comes good in the end of the books. Mm. Yeah. And readers who I um, prescribe them to and who've often read them as their first reads really go to them for comfort, I think, for having that black and white certainty at the end of the book. Mm. Yeah. I mean, even though they're obviously not um, happy no novels. There's often terrible things happening within them. Justice is done pretty much yeah. um, every time by the end of the book. Yes, Miss Marple gets her man or woman or a combination thereof. Um, you said there about comfort, and I'm interested in this idea. So much talk right now about cosy crime as, mm -hmm. as a genre, yeah. sort of kind of an oxymoron in a way. You know, when, you know there's a, a very high body count in this book. There are 12 stories, there are many, many, many more bodies. Um, but, you know, Books like um, you know Rich, Richard Coles, Richard Awesome, you know, lots of you know lots of sort of cosy loveliness, not whimsy or twee, but you know there is a kind of I think again a certainty, isn't there, that a, a comfort that comes from knowing that everything's going to work out. Yes, and at this time of huge uncertainty in every way around the world, um, I think there's that comfort of the the law or you know the justice being done but also it's going back into another era. Mm. Um, and I think that is important in terms sort of, of... Nostalgia for the time and place. Yeah, thinking about those parameters of not yeah, having yeah. a modern Miss Marple. It's actually going back to a time when um, there were no mobile phones and there was no climate change on the horizon. And um, even politics might have seemed simpler, perhaps, anyway, when you're reading Yeah, and, and also I think, I think the, the key thing about what is cosy crime now, which Christie is, but I, th I would say the, the, the bigger issue is that in thrillers, the violence is on the page. Mm. Mm. And often it's almost pornographic mm -hmm. um, in the level of description. And sometimes you have to wonder, do you need all of that? Whereas within Christie's- And it's almost always violence against women. Almost always violence against women. And with Christie, it's about the puzzle. Mm. Mm. It's not about let's show you how you shoot somebody or poison somebody. It's about how it happened, who did it, why it happened. Mm. So it's, it's intellectual mm. um, and satisfying because mm. you're kind of always trying to beat, uh, beat the author, as it were. So it, it's, it's a different kind of um, experience, I would say. Because it is about the puzzle. Sorry, you were going to say? I'm going to be controversial here, though, and say I don't think Christie is cosy crime. Go on. Um, I actually think Christie's a lot less cosy than, for example, Richard Osman, which I love. Love those books. But um, I think they're a cosy reading experience, but I think that's different from the content. Mm. Um, there's that's some real darkness there. There's a lot of talk about evil in the Marple oh, yeah, books. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Miss Marple, one of the reasons that she's a great detective is because she has a mind like a sewer, as someone says. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, she can conceive of some really dark stuff happening. Yeah. And, you know, you look elsewhere in the Christie can and you look at a book like um, Crooked House, don't want to spoil or anything, but the, yeah, yeah, that's, the yeah. solution to that book, um, the perpetrator. I mean, it still feels taboo today. Is that I think. A yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right, yeah. It's, it still feels dark yeah. and shocking. I don't want to. Do and you look at a book like, and then there were none, and there's really no yeah. comfort to be found in no, that that's book. Great. You know, it's bleak and horrible, and I love it for that. Um, <laughs> so. I think there's a really interesting thing because I think there is a co I think absolutely it's a cozy reading experience. Yeah. Because there's yeah. this wonderful. But the world and the world might be nostalgic, world. but the events and the darkness. Yeah, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yeah. You've got no, a 450 right. from Paddington. You know, the, Lucy sort of poking around in the family sepulchre. It's yeah, yeah. really gothic. Yeah. Um, so. But even with it, and then there were none. Justice is done in a sense because yes. all, all the people yes, who it's die. Very, Deserve. They've done terrible yeah, things. Yeah. They've so done they terrible things. It. So and it is awful, but... And sort of moral order <laughs> is reasserted. You know. um, yeah, and there's something deeply yeah, satisfying yeah. in that. And it's yeah. so interesting because, you know, she made the decision, Christy. Um, anybody who's read Curtain, um, and, of course, Murder on the Orient Express, those are the two moments where Poirot 
steps away from the absolute that murder is wrong, whatever, that mm. whatever the reason, yeah. mm. they should be brought to justice. Whereas Miss Marple never does. Never, no. Mm. Because of the puzzle thing, do you think that they bear rereading if, if you know, or do you think you've kind of forgotten or you don't care by that point, you're just along for the ride? Definitely great to reread. If you're anything like me, I've, I've actually got a really bad memory for plot. <laughs> <laughs> so, and I read most of my Agatha Christie's in my teens. Mm. So I love going back to them now, uh, a couple of decades later, and um, completely re experience You're 29 them. as well. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, and actually, I recently read a brilliant book for true Agatha Christie nerds called The Forensics of Agatha Christie yes, it's so by good. Carla Valentine, yeah. Yeah. which goes into immense detail about all the poisons and, as you were mm. saying, shows you how she was really ahead of... Uh, Christie was really ahead of the game with understanding forensics. And it's so fascinating to analyse the plot through that lens mm. of yeah. forensics, because Carla Valentine yeah. knows her stuff because she's actually a, um, someone that looks after dead bodies uh, someone that looks after dead bodies. Mortician. 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 That's a really lovely way of describing a mortician. Someone that looks after looks dead after. bodies. <laughs> um, Not a serial killer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, is there a danger that this volume of poisons could be used as an instruction manual? I mean, how explicit is it? It Pretty is quite explicit, explicit. Yeah. 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 Yeah, no, it's a, it's a worry. <laughs> funny, my my um, husband's uh, students from his latest, uh, he teaches creative writing, he's a writer himself, and, things, and they gave him um, a T-shirt to say thank you, which said, be careful, otherwise I'll put you in my next novel. Really? <laughs> I say that, you know, with, be careful, otherwise I'll poison you. <laughs> Wasn't that one of the other things that you wanted to know, I think, um, that, that Harper wanted to know, was how we were going to do our victim in because they didn't want us all to use poison. I think they thought... Yeah, that's we right, we'd all do poison. All oh, right, so you had to specify the means of death. And the time of year, oh, yes, right. which was a very, you know, because yeah. they didn't want... Because Miss Marple you've got one Christmas, Christmas in here or two I Christmas? I couldn't do Christmas. Two Ruth Ware stole yeah. Christmas. Yeah, Ruth Ware yeah. got yeah. Christmas. Yeah. 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 Um, they didn't want everybody, yeah, <laughs> sort of at the same time. Mine's in August, which was not very fashionable, it turned out. Um, you know, but, I mean, I, th I think, you know, the thing about what we all did, that we... We weren't given each other's stories to start with. Uh -huh. We were asked to say what ours were going to be so that obviously the publishers could have a proper arc and it would be a good mm. collection and that they then would have to decide what order to put them in. But I think we all sat waiting to read each other's stories yeah. with as much excitement as yeah. we would have done if there'd been a new Christie manuscript. Yeah. Like, yeah. You know, we wanted to see what everybody had come up with. Yeah, of course you did. I mean, yeah. they are, they, they, there is a good range of murders, a nice range of deaths, and a lovely range over seasons as well. Um, should we talk a wee bit about your story? And then I'm going to read from your story because your voice is a wee bit gone. Um, and I, lovely I'm gonna... excuse just to listen to you. Read <laughs> um, so set the story up for us and then I'll read the bit that you've asked me to read. So funny enough, there are lots of parallels between our stories, I realise, because yeah. um, Miss Marple is visiting an old friend, an old school friend, um, Prudence, in Sussex, in <laughs> Sussex. We both um, live in Sussex. <laughs> Sussex. Um, in a place called Mian Maltravers, which is normally a very well-behaved, you know, small town, village, small town. Um, but on one night every year, two weeks after Guy Fawkes Night, they have their own sort of bonfire night-esque celebration, which is very much inspired by, I don't know if anyone's been to Lewis, um, to the bonfire night celebrations, but I went and it was, I mean, you must go. I've never gone because it never horrifies. Gone. It's terrifying. It is, idea, yeah. I find it absolutely horrifying. terrifying. It's yeah. So you actually went? Yeah. With that long hair, you went to Lewis Bonfire. <laughs> set on fire. It, it, no. it is, um, and we got up. We got our position right at the front, you know, because we wanted to see it all. And then it got really kind of feral and wild, and people were sort of shoving and pushing. And there were all these lanterns. I mean, it was amazing. It was wonderful. <laughs> You're but such a crime really writer. You're like, I loved it. I loved, <laughs> I loved it. it. it, was great. it loved the darkness. <laughs> Did you but take children with you, or, or was it? Were you there on your own? Just no, me and my parents. Okay. But I think they were like, oh, child, you know, yeah. sort of. Yeah. But it's really. Um, pagan you know and yeah. and the sort of history goes back centuries and there are these sort of different societies like That's the bonfire right. societies um and i think it was actually after the um 
the processions, when sort of everything's got a bit loose and everyone goes to their own bonfire, that it felt really fraught, you know, and there are just sort of bangers going off in the streets and things. Yeah. So I just really wanted to play with that and have right. this mm. place that, you know, is this beautiful sort of quaint village, very much what we associate, I think, with the sort of image of Marple, image of, of Agatha Christie, and then have it turn really other and dark and sort of feral. Um, okay. mm -hmm. is, is that my cue? Yes. Oh, I've got this. Yes. I've got the we're, cardinals. We're, got, we're about to burn the Pope sort of just effigies. for you. We're about they have to these burn kind the of effigies. It's amazing. Um, and they torched Liz Truss this year as well. Yes, you? yeah. And the year I went, it it's was Donald Trump. <laughs> Donald Trump. Donald Trump, I think. Donald Trump. Um, and the bomb. But um, I should also say that Miss Marple and Prudence are doing a very kind of Miss Marple and Prudence thing. They're actually going to a choir rehearsal. Yep. So you know, they're this sort of bastion of sort of Christian righteousness, as Prudence says, in the middle of all these sort of pagan goings on. And they're, they're school friends, but they're not the best of friends. They're not like your two friends. No. They're, it's like school friends, but kind like, of, friend, kind of yeah. like... Mm. Well, Prudence, I mean, yeah. she's, you know, she's, yeah, you can, yeah. Okay, so uh, a few moments later, they stepped out into the crisp November air, drawing their coats closely about them. They were, here they were confronted by a stream of masked figures marching past the front door to the house. They were like something from a medieval painting. Demons and fiends come to carry the sinners away. The acrid scent of burning paraffin caught at the back of the throat. Several of them were beating drums. All carried lighted torches and several groups had hoisted aloft life-size papier-mâché figures with hideously distorted features, oversized heads and bulging eyes, clad in the red robes and caps of Catholic cardinals. There was a strange hum of energy about them. It felt dangerous, even flammable, as though any seconds the very air might ignite. Miss Marple paused, staring, at once fascinated and repelled. Prudence beckoned in her head girl manner, taking no notice of the throng. This way. They had to push their way through the crowd. Several times Miss Marple felt herself jostled. Once she could have sworn that a hand reached out to give her a rather hard shove out the way, and she struggled to regain her footing. It didn't seem to matter a jot to these people that there were two elderly women in their midst. She heard the woof of the paraffin torches as they swayed above the masked heads, felt the heat of the flames on her cheeks, felt a little frisson of disquiet at being caught among these intent, anonymous figures who moved as one, like a herd or a marauding army. I don't understand, Miss Marple said to Prudence after they had managed to ford the flood of bodies and were standing on the other side of the road. Guy Fawkes' night was two weeks ago. They had a bonfire in the fields by St Mary Mead. Dr Haydock contributed some Roman candles and Griselda Clement, the vicar's wife, produced some sort of spiced wine. What was it called? Something foreign. Glue vine. Yes, that was it. Delicious. Perhaps a touch too much cinnamon. Of course, I didn't stay for long, far too cold. Ah, said Prudence, but they do everything rather differently in me on Maltravers, a little like the Cornish. Tonight's revels commemorate not the death of a band of Catholic rebels, but the immolation of 17 Protestant martyrs at the town cross. It's why they burn the cardinals, the figurines, you know. I suppose you could say it's a sort of revenge, albeit 700 years later. Sorry, several hundred years later. Revenge, said Miss Marple, almost to herself. Revenge and settling of scores. That's another thing one finds a great deal of in small, out-of-the-way places. Well, though the score here is so many centuries old, it's predominantly the youths of the town that are involved. And let me tell you, Prudence said, casting a disapproving eye over the revels. Religion has very little to do with it at all. In fact, it feels rather apt that we should be going to choir practice tonight. We will form a bastion of Christian righteousness in the midst of these pagan goings on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, thank you. Could you always read my work? <laughs> you know what? It's so lovely reading somebody else's work and getting applause for it and not having had to write myself. Uh -huh. It's just absolutely delicious. Anyway, um, it's, it's a brilliant story, and yet we've got Lewis in there, sort of thinly, thinly disguised. <laughs> thinly. Um, she mentions 
uh, Miss Marple mentions small places, and three of your novels have been set in small places, a, a hunting lodge, an Irish island, a, a Paris apartment. What is the attraction for you to these confined environments? Well, I love ring fencing my characters, you know, and putting them under the microscope, and that's a really fun way of doing it. Um, practically speaking, um, you kind of close off your circle of suspects, so that's quite nice um, and convenient. Different in the Paris apartment, because obviously mm. I sort of wanted to have my cake and eat it, so I wanted a Parisian apartment in the middle of this sort of bustling metropolis, but mm. I also wanted this sense that when you shut that front gate, it's like another world, you've entered another world, so in this sort of very gothic sense, the the apartment block is like this sort of beast swallowing the character's whole. It's like another mm. character in the book. Um, but so I love all of that. In the first two novels, I loved seeing the way in which, uh, well, no, in all three novels, actually, but I think in the first two especially, you have nature red in tooth and claw, and you have, you're looking at the way in which that sort of infects the characters in a way and brings mm. out sort of something latent and feral in them. And I think kind that's... Of a folk horror Like aspect. a sort of folk horror. And yeah. I think that's what I was playing with in, in this story, you know, how does this sort of night change people? What does it bring out in, you know, these normal sort of, normally sort of well, well behaved, law abiding, you know, townspeople um, who, who just rub along um, mm. day to day. And again, we're in, a, we're in a village setting, so we've got, you know, class resentments mm. galore, um, assumptions about people, obedient maids, disobedient maids. Without giving the plot away, tell us a bit more about who else is in the story. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, the, um, I think the moral of this story is sort of treat um, your servants badly at your peril, you know, it's sort yeah. of... Um, <laughs> so there's... De oh, God, I'm trying to think of a way not to spoiler it, but there is definitely this sort of... Let's talk about our victim, first of all, shall we? Yes. Who is she? So she is a foreigner, and I think that's a big part of it. So she is newly arrived um, in Myanmar Travers. Uh, she's French, she's the new choir mistress. She's really put noses out of joint because she's sort of, she's, she's rather beautiful. I imagine her as being rather beautiful. And she's sort of displaced the old choir mistress, you know, and she's also, she's, she's really peed people off for other reasons. Um, you know, she, she keeps her lights on at night because she's, I mean, a house is in the middle of the woods really. Yep. So, you know, it's a spooky place to be and she's upset the local bird watching society. Um, We're very concerned about screech owls. Screech owls, yep. they yep. are. Yep. Um, so, so all of that, but I think the main thing is that she's foreign and yeah. so people are sort of deeply suspicious of her and I think that's something that Christie was sort of very interested in. I mean, you look at the character of Poirot, he's a, he's a Belgian refugee um, originally mm. um, and so playing with that sort of otherness. But it's so interesting that the collection does that in a way that's very contemporary, because I think if you're reading some of the older stuff, you're like, whoa, wait a minute, this is, this is how we're, we're describing people then? But mm -hmm. of course, that's then, and this is now, but you have to keep her in the then, not mm -hmm. in the now. So you're, you're, you're thinking about the character uh, in such a way as, to, you know, to, for her to be perceiving people as insiders and outsiders without rejecting them because of who they are. And that's an interesting conundrum as a writer. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I think it's fair to say that there are some fairly dodgy attitudes in some of the sort yeah. of... <laughs> I think we should say it, just, just say that, and then we can also say she's a, she's a wonderful writer. So, um, but, you know, I think Miss Marple is they're very... They're not carried forward to this. No, yeah. they're not. Um, but Miss Marple is very fair yeah. in the way she views people, I think. She's always been very fair, and she takes people at face value. Mm. You know, and she listens to the servants, and she listens to the people that are sort of on the fringes, um, and that's really one of her superpowers. Um, so that's something I very much wanted to explore here. She looks at who else this woman might have been, as well as just being this sort of French choir mistress that sort of swanned in with her sort of beautiful bohemian scarves and mm. all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, did the story come to you as one? Were you one of the people that the editor sort of told and you were like, yes, this is it, or did you write oh, your way through no. it? Oh, um, no. I mean, we had this Zoom chat with all of us on the Zoom, oh, which did was you? so mm. exciting, because r really, really right at the beginning, which is so exciting because... I mean, it was, and, and so intimidating because so many of my sort of literary heroes were like right there on the screen. <laughs> um, Kate, uh, Ellie Griffiths, who I love, I'm obsessed with her. You talked about um, 
you know, women uh, breastfeeding in the middle of the night and reading Agatha Christie. That's what I did with Ellie Griffiths and the wow. Ruth Galloway mysteries. Just I looked forward to waking up in the middle of the night so I could <laughs> read a bit more about Ruth and Nelson and all of that. Um, so it was, it was wonderful and really intimidating. And then everyone talked through their stories and they all had a really wonderfully fully formed idea of what they were going to write. <laughs> it's just like... I don't think uh, I can swear. You were like sort of saying they're like, uh. um, So no, um, I think at that stage, I was still very much in the, oh, I'm really honored to be asked, but I don't feel worthy of this. I've got to read everything, you know, every Miss Marple, watch all of the adaptations, really enjoy it, but also, you know, try and think my, myself into her shoes. Um, and only then did I feel sort of ready to, ready to step into her shoes. Um, but when I did, the story all came together quite quickly, mm. I think. Um, so I find that with short stories, I can only ever write the actual short story in quite a short space of time, mm. um, which might come as a surprise because I think I was the last to deliver as well. <laughs> <laughs> well but I wrote it quickly, it? No, but it's late. It's far too discreet to say anything, but I think you were. I or they just said that to you know, get me to, to, to move to I'm interested, in, in your life before you were a writer, I mean, we've all writers have always been writers, but in your life before you worked as a writer, you were an editor. Mm. And I wonder how that affects your writing process, the way you, the way you approach it. <laughs> I really naively thought it would make me a great editor of my own work. <laughs> and that is emphatically not the case. Um, but I think it's given me an understanding of the importance, the huge importance of that editorial relationship. Um, mm. I have to say this because my editor's on the front row. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, it's so important. And really for me, I hand in pretty rough first drafts. Right. And so the book is really built, you know, in that kind of editing process. You know, I love writing that sort of messy first draft, but it really comes together you know, by about draft 17 or whatever it is. Oh, really? That many? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I mean, there's 17. I mean, Maggie O'Farrell, I once interviewed her, and she did 17 drafts, I think, of Hamnet. Um, and then of the more recent one, you know, only needed three. But I think she did say something like 16 or 17. So. Well, Maggie O'Farrell also said this wonderful thing, because I'm a really wasteful writer, so I write a lot of stuff that doesn't make it into the final, doesn't make the final cut. And she said this wonderful thing, which I found very soothing, which is that all of that sort of extra stuff all those darlings you have to kill, yeah. they need to be there because that's the um, scaffolding mm -hmm. around hopefully your beautiful edifice that appears when it all falls away. Yeah, so they're, no, they're necessary, cool necessary part of the process, mm. aren't they? Mm. I mean, and they might never be published and it's not like they're in a drawer waiting to come out, but they've done something to move the story yes. forward to, and to also make you as a writer feel like, actually, I didn't waste that, waste that yeah. day. I might yeah. have wasted 500 <laughs> words, but I haven't wasted that day because yeah. I got... I understood something about I my character. I understood something, yeah. absolutely. I yeah. unlocked something. Or I'd perhaps. solved a puzzle. Or, yes. in, in an interview once you said that you didn't ever know who your killer was when you started out. And it's so hard to believe when you, your, you know, your books are so intricately plotted. So how, at what point do you, do you realise and do you change your mind? Yeah, so with each of the murder mysteries, and it happened with this story as well, um, with each of my murder mysteries, I've had a really clear idea of who done it at the beginning and I've started writing and then about a third of the way through, I have suddenly had this sort of light bulb moment and I thought, it's not them, mm. Mm. it's them. Mm. And that's been such an exciting moment and I kind of live for those moments as a writer and that's actually why I don't, you know, I plot a little bit, but I don't plot too rigidly yeah. because I want, to ha I want to have those discoveries exactly. along the way. Yeah. And is it the character that reveals themselves to you? Yes, they sort of, it's like almost Amazing. like a little whisper. In they become like themselves. It. Yes. Mm. And then therefore they can only behave in character. Mm -hmm. mm. So obviously it couldn't be him, it's got to be her. Yeah. Because they're all behaving in character once yeah. you start to write them. They I really truly understood that for the first time. Writing a, writing a novel, the origins of the expression in character and out of character. You might want people to do things, yeah, yeah. but they're not going to. Yeah. If if you do make them do them, it's just going to the reader's just going to go. This is bullshit. They, there's no way that person would do that. That's yeah. that's yeah. not who they are. And you've made them who they are. So you can kind of try and make them again differently, but it's very very hard yeah. um, when you're sort of 300 pages in, as I am right now with a novel and finding <laughs> hey, that's called to me. <laughs> Trying to wrangle yeah, exactly what I want, but, I, but I'm always fascinated by that. Are you a, are you a plotter? Because you, no. Guys, no, but your books are like that, and they're so intricate. Exactly. They are, no, but but no. So I know the sort of book I'm writing. I know the historical backdrop against which it's happening. Yes. And then, and I know the kind of characters that are going to take the story forward. 
and then I start and see where we go. Really? Yeah. Like because the for, for me, I do three drafts, and so the first draft... Three drafts as a rule, like, you're like I'm yeah. not going to do any more, that's it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, so it, it, you know, the first draft is all emotion. It's, okay, let's write this, and I work seven days a week until I've got a draft. Then I kind of sit back. Mostly I don't have enough time to sit back because I'm always late. Um, and the second draft is all intellect. So it's exactly that thing of, this character doesn't work. That scene mm. is in the wrong place. This story isn't delivering anything. Uh, the mystery is too obscure or it's too obvious or, you know, all of that kind of thing. Mm. And then the third draft is writing the book as it should have been written in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> you have to go on that journey, I think. You have to go on the journey. And, you, and, and also it's like, um, you know, it, in terms of the discovery, for me, and we were talking about this, we're both, you know, up to the wire girls. It's, I need I... the fear of failure <laughs> in order to access the thing that makes it my book. Right. You know, I'm 61 now. I have never delivered a book on time. <laughs> I'm never going to deliver a book on time. Um, and it's just that, you know, I'm delivering my new novel in 10 days' time, but yet here I am. You are not. Um, this, uh, yeah, Indeed. Uh, it won't be the whole novel, that's for sure. Uh, but it will be some of it. And, but it, but it, it's clear, that, and, and I think you are the same, aren't you, Lucy, that I have plenty of time <laughs> to write this novel. But it's like... Tra -la 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 -la. <laughs> um, until the moment that it's not possible to deliver it on time. And then at that moment, that level of fear is what helps me access the adrenaline that needs to be on the page. Is this a new Burning Chambers book that's too intense? It is, yes. And it's, um, I've been very flippantly, and my publishers keep telling me to stop saying this, but um, it's basically lesbian pirates. Sounds amazing. Um, and, <laughs> and, so you know, excited. It's called it. The Ghost Ship. Um, and, it, you know, but... You know, because it's that moment in the sequence where, of course, of course, women disguise themselves as men. Why wouldn't they? Mm. Oh, my God. But all the complications that go with that. Mm. Um, and there weren't, you know, lots of female pirates, but where there were quite a lot. There were enough of them to have hot lesbian sex yeah, on the high exactly. seas. <laughs> Very exciting. Or possibly about quite. That. Uh, no, I'm not going to say wet and slippery because I was thinking, <laughs> I was thinking of the ship, but I realised that would have come out terribly badly. Um, anyway, no. So I mean, and, and there were, you know, there were. There's lots of evidence of, you know, the, the famous ones are much later than I'm writing, Bonnie and Reed. Um, but you know, pirates, two women marrying each other, and it yeah. was completely um, there. It's all documented. And, but of course, it makes sense, doesn't it? Mm. So, but. I've read all of this. This book has been ready to go for ages, but yet, yet it's yet. about to be late. I mean, it, it's just every time. Every single Pressure time. Pressure makes diamonds, <laughs> you know. <laughs> what, where, are you at? where are you I'm at? <laughs> where are you at with your next book? About to be late, ten I days, imagine. Ten days, ten days' time? Not quite in ten days, but pretty soon. Right. Um, December. Um, okay. so, oh, there we go. Yeah. Well, that's like 20 days or 50 it's days. Not that right? long. No, you <laughs> said the next month. You put in another month so that you make it so much further that's away. The that's yeah. the difference. Where is it? yours, Damien? When's yours due? Oh, God, that's such a great question. <laughs> Thank you for asking. Is it, it though? <laughs> <laughs> See, this is why. Isn't it why? I mean, partly for me that I admire Agatha Christie so much. The industrious. She just got on with Oh, my yeah. goodness. You know, yeah. two books a year. Um, 120? Oh, how many? How, I don't know, 120. No, I think I it's seven, it seven novels, isn't it? 77. I, I, it's Published it's embarrassing, I know all this. 77 think. novels, I mean, I think 199, 100 short stories. Um, I mean, it gets confusing because, of course, some of them are renamed and yeah. all of that kind and of thing. And some of them appear in other forms. Yeah, but books. I mean, but she just did it. Yeah. Mm. She just yeah. did it, didn't make a fuss. Um, you know, that all of you, you know, you can only imagine, can't you, that campaign. You know, we've been lucky, we've had some campaigns, but that whole thing of a Christie for Christmas. Yeah. Um, and it was just that inevitable 
set point of, of people's reading life. Mm. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, I admire that enormously, that she just didn't, Absolutely. there was nothing precious about it. Reading about her made me think about Walter Scott in that Absolutely. two figures who yeah. redefined the way publishing yeah, happens. Yeah. You know, yeah. Walter Scott, the first writer to get an advance, to receive a literary advance, and then, you know, to in, in that way become a, an, a name, even though he had behind lots of other names. And then, you know, Christie becoming this brand and yeah. the Christie for Christmas. and. The, you know, the, the calendar year revolving around the appearance of her And books. also, you know, the, you know, the story of Ryder Haggard, yeah. which I, I love because I love those old fashioned adventure stories. Uh, you, you and I both share Walter yeah. Scott um, uh, as, as, as a person. But the idea that, you know, he's sitting with his brother on a train and sees this big advertisement, I think for, I can't remember what it was for, maybe for Treasure Island. I can't remember what it was for. And, you know, his brother basically said, I bet you can't write a novel like that. And he said, I bet I can. Huh. Really? And then we get King Solomon's Mind, one of the wow. great wow. adventure wow. stories, written in six weeks, I think. That that is that was You've got time, Lucy. I haven't. <laughs> 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 it was the same with Christy, that she wrote her first novel because it was um, her sister said to her, I bet you can't write a detective novel. Yeah. Mm. So you know, I mean, it's, it, you know, so in a way, double dare. it's double dare, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it well, I'm going to take some questions uh, from people online, but also from people um, in the room. So let's hope that our iPad um, works. Okay, here we go. Um, so, question for, for all three of you, but I'll go, we'll, go from, we'll go from here. What do you think is Miss Marple's most enduring quality? I misread that as endearing at first, but we'll go for enduring. I think that she, well, I mean, Lucy said this really, that she has a clear moral landscape that you know that whatever she finds out, the decision will always be the same. Mm. She, she won't... Change. No fear or favour. No fear or favour. Yeah. Yeah. Did you say the same? Gosh, I'm trying to think. Was it enduring or endearing? Well, I think we'll take either because <laughs> I misread it. So um, I'm going to say her most endearing quality, I think, is her sense of humour. Yeah. Because yeah. she really does. Even as she's sort of underestimated and patronised by those around her, mm. there's a sort of almost Austin-like quality to her, I think, in the way she sort of deals with these very patronising men. You know, these. I had a lot of fun with um, the inspector uh, yes. in my short story because he sort of models himself on this sort of noir hero. He's a know, Chandler he's, hero. He's a Chandler hero. Chandler was so rude about Christie and the sort of English, you know, little quaint murder mystery and things. Um, and she just sort of, it's like water of a duck, off a duck's back. In fact, she sort of, she uses that to run rings around these people. So, yeah. and I love the, I love the humour in them. I think it's, that's, that's a, a really funny moment where the inspector says to her, "Can you hear me, madam?" And she's like, "Yes, that's yes." Such I a guess. trope. But it's isn't such it? a trope, but it's yeah. so brilliantly funny. And there's also a really good bit in the Miss Marple Takes Manhattan story where she's sitting in this American hotel, but it's like an American version of the of French furniture. So basically, like Trump Tower. Yeah. And she and she just she just can't deal with the hideousness of it anymore, and she starts talking to the furniture, <laughs> and then decides that she's going to go going to go on a very eventful shopping trip. Um, it's brilliant. She's very funny. Um, okay, so um, here we go. Question from Jill Warnock: Does it take a woman to write a Marple story? Mm. Oh, great question. Well, this is oh. I'm going to say yeah. <laughs> I think I just yeah. I mean, I I think I asked that question. I don't know if you did. I you know I you asked. Yeah, yeah, I did. I wanted to know who else mm. would have been asked, mm -hmm. um, because I wanted to feel that it was a diverse group of writers and mm. it would be different. Um, but actually, I did feel. I hope that it's women. Mm. So I was really pleased about that. But do I believe that? Men can write brilliant women and yeah, women can write yeah. brilliant men. Yes, I do. I think a writer who is worth her or his salt can mm. write anybody. Mm. That's true. Um, and I, I feel that very strongly because it's about imagination. Yeah, imagination yeah. coupled with, you know, creative responsibility and why, why, why you're doing it. But Richard Coles was in the video at the start there. I mean, he's a Marple super fan. And when I told him, you know, I was, I was, I was doing this, he was like, why didn't I get asked to write a story? <laughs> Not that he was bitter about it or it is in any way waiting under your bed, Anna, uh, for when you get home. But like, you know, but, but, you know, of course he went on and he's written his own, you know, Champton. It's yeah. an absolutely brilliant um, world that he's created there. But you were saying earlier, the publisher was saying earlier, there may be another volume and it may, it may, men may be allowed to write. But I think it's brilliant that it's a, a you know, all women. Yeah, and she, that, that is a very important part of Marple. Yeah. 
I would say, that she has fashioned. There were so many women who, they were essentially told that their lives didn't matter because mm. they were on their own. And she is the literary example of, I've got a great life. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, you yeah. know that level of. She's very happy. Yeah. yeah. So I think I, I do think it was the right decision actually. Yeah. You described her, I think, in an interview as a feminist icon or a feminist <laughs> hero. At one She'd point. hate that yeah. though. Yeah. No, and this is the thing. I think it was slightly tongue in cheek, and you yeah. know the way these things in print yeah. sort of get a little bit twisted. Um, because she's not a feminist. She's no, no. not a feminist. Yeah. She believes um, gentlemen need a hard liquor sometimes. Absolutely, mm -hmm. but she, you know, I mean, she she tells someone to make sure you look after your husband and cook for him, you know, and she's, yeah. she's a bit disapproving of unmarried mothers, you know. Mm. I mean, there are some sort of d deeply Victorian traditionalist views. Um, but, you know, this sort of idea of her kind of superpower, being her invisibility, all of that, she's a woman of that, you know, all of that, it, there's, there's some lovely feminist stuff there, mm. even if she herself mm. isn't necessarily. And I don't think Agatha Christie was a, was a feminist. Well, no. I don't think we can say that. I mean, she, she apparently used to put on forms. I, I um, learned this from Lucy Worsley's brilliant book about her. It's a great book. Um, so yeah, it's, good. It's good, um, good. But she used to, when, when she was asked to fill in her occupation, she would put housewife. Mm. Um, but I think there's also a playfulness yes. there, mm. and I think there is with Marple as well. And also, do you know, uh, I, I can't remember the name of the particular short story with one of the, you know, the murder club stories, um, when they're all telling the things, but the actress Jane, and at one moment she says, we, we ladies must stick together. Yes. Mm. So she does... Solidarity. Uh, yeah. 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 I think a gay man would, would write a really good um, yeah. Miss Marple story, though, for those very reasons that... Uh, Miss Marple is pretending to be one thing when she's actually another, yes. and yeah. perhaps um, there ought to be a, a gay. I an Alex. entire volume of. I can Marple really see the Agatha Christie estate going for this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. I'm totally yeah. into I it. I, I'm totally yeah. into it. I get exactly. Which is, it's why it's the, it's it's the whole gay spy novel scene. It's why it's so mm. it's so good. Yeah. Um, so uh, a, a question. Again, going back to acting, thinking about who would you have play Miss Marple today. Oh. No, if we're having a new Marple today. I would have, because uh, in a part because I read an interview with her very recently, but I think she's a wonderful um, actor and she has that kind of quirky thing. I would have Anna Maxwell Martin. Oh, she's mm. great. Because she would just That's be... That's a great show. The audience yeah. love that. That's she'd a great be show. really great because she'd kind of be a modern version of slightly independent and outside of mm. the mainstream, Ooh. not bothered about... You know, Miss Marple's not bothered about what she looks like mm. and how she behaves. She just is. So she'd be mine. I would have Leslie Manville, but at the because uh, she she obviously seems so young, but at the at the younger end of Marple in her mm. in her when when she was sort of sixty five. Mm. Um, just because I love her. I just think she's wonderful. Um, and I've just been watching... Could I have asked you that question about any character and you'd have gone, I'd have Leslie Manville. Leslie Manville. I'd have Leslie oh. Manville. Oh. Like that. Yeah. Leslie, Leslie Manville. Manville. She's, you know, yeah. It's just glorious. Um, she's like Princess <laughs> Margaret. But I've been watching um, the adaptation of uh, The Magpie Murders. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. So yeah. Anthony Horowitz is brilliant. Um, sort Thank of you. book within a book, murder mystery within a murder mystery. Actually, I think he could make but he could write a great Marple. Yes. But he did write a, an awful lot of the television adaptations were written by Anne. Yes, yeah. yes. And so he's had, you know, Holmes, he's done Moriarty. Yeah, he's brilliant. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah, just yeah. this he's amazing yeah. ventriloquist. Yes. You know, as well as writing his own brilliant sort of... But um, she, in that series, you know, she's a woman of a certain age mm. who, um, you know, is an unlikely detective, um, but is sort of... she's. She's just brilliant. Um, All right. She has an amazing wardrobe. Yeah. Yeah, we really get that, we get that you love her. We yeah. get that you love her. Who would you go for, Ella? I would nominate someone who not everyone will know, who's called Sarah Mallon, who's a really fantastic actress. What was she in? She's in. She actually is very often a forensic scientist mm -hmm. in um, murder mystery right. um, TV series. There was one called All That Remains, right. which is really fantastic. So she's kind of the person coming up with... And the, she's quite often wearing a white coat okay. and um, yeah. being in the sidelines, but she's a really great act actor. Mm. And um, she's tall, and I think she'd get the comic element and the kind of feistiness at the same but time. You can't beat Joan Hickson. I'm I don't, I, I'd... Angela Geraldine. Lansbury, I'm just going to say again. <laughs> um, I would do Siobhan Redmond. I oh, think no, she'd be, be very, very good. good. She yeah. would, yeah. Um, I yeah. think she would be brilliant for 
obvious reasons. Mm. Um, okay, so questions from the audience. I realize we're rapidly running out of time. Um, uh, gentleman there, uh, person on the end. Yep, you. You want, Just wait for the microphone. It's going to get to you. Yeah, thank you. You're um, welcome. Because Miss Marple's not a chief of police, she's not a retired chief of police, she's not an aristocrat, she kind of starts as an inconvenience and be she becomes a necessity, doesn't she? Mm. Do, is, does that inform the structure of a story, mm. do you think, for Miss Marple's stories? That's interesting. Yes, question. absolutely, because she has to... She's always there either by invitation or on sufferance, um, and she doesn't necessarily have access to all the information. And that's what's really interesting. You mentioned the 450 um, from Paddington, that she's really outside of that story, almost all of the story. Um, you know, she's just had to put somebody else in place because there's no way that she can get any of the information. So it, do it does make um, these stories so different from mm. almost every other one of the Golden Age crime. I'm a big fan of Nio Marsh. Well, I do too. I'm a I really know. big fan of Dorothy L. Sayers. I'm a big fan of um, Josephine Tay. And Marple is different, you know, because Poirot is a police officer. Mm. He's retired, but he's a police officer and he's still in the system. And she is, bizarrely, the perennial outsider. Mm. 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 Um, I love 450 from Paddington. Yeah, me too. I just reread it the other day. It, because she's like the spy master. Yeah, yes. I was thinking about this. Yeah. She's sort of running her yeah. agent. Yeah, yeah. It's so cool. Um, no, I think, yeah, fascinating question. I absolutely agree with Kate. Um, you know, I think. The wonderful thing about her is she she talks to all the people that the police forget. Mm. You know, she's she's there on the edges, mm. as you said, sort of having these conversations, talking to the servants, um, and there's just something wonderful about that, and, and 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 makes it feel really different in terms of texture. And it's something I played with uh, in my recent novel, The Paris Apartment. You know, I wanted a character who was like a sleuth in the novel, um, but is very much not a detective. I mean, she's got a huge mistrust of the police and sort of very much operates outside the law and doesn't have all the information, you know, has almost less information than you do as the reader. But so she's got a lot stacked against her, but mm. still has to sort of survive on her wits. It was a fun thing to do. It was a fun exercise. Mm. Um, hand up here. Yes, at the front. Or just wait, the microphone's coming to you. Thank you so much for this evening. It's been a wonderful discussion. Um, I noted at the beginning you mentioned that Agatha Christie had written her uh, endings to both Poirot and Marple uh, in the Second World War, uh, just in case something happened to her. And I was wondering what her, what her plan was for later in life, if there was a sort of ending that she'd planned and how you guys were uh, sort of if you were involved in sort of an end at all for Miss Marple? Uh, clearly not, but... Um, well, that's an interesting question. I don't think you said that. As part of your rules, you weren't allowed to kill her, presumably. No, that must have been a rule, yeah. presumably. I was an unwritten rule. <laughs> don't <laughs> kill her. Yeah. Yeah, we wouldn't have dared. No, it, it's a really interesting question because um, the Marple that she wrote is much earlier. I mean, it, it, you know, in terms of how old Miss Marple is and when it probably sits in the sequence, it's certainly set in the 30s rather than, you know, post Second World War. And so the last marble that Christie wrote is Nemesis. Mm. And she's an old woman then, and she does what's required of her. And that's the end. Mm. We don't know what happens to Marple. Whereas with the curtain, the Priory one, she kills him. Mm. Mm. So it, it is very interesting. And that's actually, and there's always been a rather not romantic part of me, but a sentimental part of me that's thought she didn't want to kill Mark. No, I don't. I think she quite enjoyed killing. I mean, she'd Poirot. really. Borrow <laughs> 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 enough now. <laughs> yeah. We're done with you. We're done yeah. with you. Okay, time for one more. Ooh, there's lots and lots of hands up. Question. Yes, hold on one more second. Get a microphone to you. Run there. <laughs> no, no, no we'll, we'll get a microphone to you. There you go. It's on its way. They've sort of put you in there. There you yeah. go. No pressure on this question, <laughs> no. <laughs> Do you think anyone will ever dare to write a marple with dementia? Or oh, that's losing a great her question. Insight? Well, I mean, they, they can't write a marple without permission from the estate. I mean, so they, they could, um, you know. Fan I mean, fiction. Yeah, well, P Patricia Wentworth did this. Um, the Miss Silver mysteries are essentially Marple, I would say. 
Um, that might be a slightly heretical thing to say. I really enjoy them, but um, you know, Miss Silver is a version of Miss Marple, and she clearly decided that she was just going to write her own version, and they are really satisfying, um, and there are many similarities, um, I would say. Um, but I can't imagine... Well, I mean, the estate might decide to commission Marple continuations, but I, I don't know. I mean, why would you do that? Yeah. Is what I would feel. Why would you do that? Well, I mean, it, it's... No, no, I mean, it'd be, it'd be interesting, but, I mean, mm. it, it kind of would take real. away her agency. It, mm. it, it would, but it would be interesting to see be. that process and to, to see her holding onto or not holding onto things. I think it's an interesting, it's an interesting question to ask. It's an interesting exercise. Yeah. yeah. Um, but, I mean, I wouldn't... I, I would struggle with, yeah. with, with that. It'd be a very hard read. I think again, be... Like, Elizabeth is missing, though. Think yes, I was just thinking. Yeah. Yeah. No, but it's not right. that that's not a really important area to no, write course. about. It really, really is. But I think it's, I think it may be, I don't know, because I, I don't know, I mean, these guys, are, you know, from the publishers know the estate really well, and we don't, mm. at least I don't. Um, but I think that protection of the person that Christie wanted her Miss Marple to be in the yes. world is really important. And yeah. if you start to make her vanish, which mm. essentially that would be, yeah. um, be that would be, it would be rather, I don't know, I, I would find that really sad, I think, actually. I, I do too, I think it would be tragic, but really interesting question. Yeah, yeah. really yeah. interesting. And I think there are loads of spaces in the stories and in the novels for other adventures, for mm. other things to happen, whether intentionally left by Christy as, you know, crumbs and breadcrumbs for herself in the mm. future, um, or, you know, things that, you know, crevices mm. that you can kind of, um, you know, force your way into and find new I mean, there's a, lot, there's a lot of biographical more. information about Marple, yeah. actually. When, yeah. when you're reading for, to look for it, yeah. yes. didn't you find yes. that? Yes. You thought, oh, there's so many stories that you could tell that, are, that Christie's put on the page that anybody, if any of us were doing continuations, you could write a version of a story that Christie has hinted at. Yes. There's, there's so many of them yeah. that are there already. Exciting, exciting, exciting. Um, uh, so I know that you didn't all get to ask your questions. If you want to ask some of them on Twitter um, or in the signing afterwards, um, please, uh, please do that. I have the names of our competition winners. So our online winner is Emma Taylor. So Emma, please uh, get in touch uh, on Twitter or on Instagram so that we can send you your bundle of lovely things. Do get a new bookshelf put up for all your marbles. Um, and our in-room competition winner is Alfredo Carpanetti. So congratulations to Alfredo. Do you want to put your hand up and identify yourself? There you go. Um, I do hope, I can, well, ripple of applause for you there for doing nothing other than win. Um, uh, you can catch past salons on our our podcast, um, which you can get via you, the usual subscription routes or from our website, www.thelitrysalon.co.uk. You can catch me and Kate blethering away on the Big Scottish Book Club, which is oh, yeah. when I play away, had a lovely time trying to get we an did. award in Edgeways with Elaine C. Smith. It was very, very, very <laughs> She tiny. won. She uh, really she did won. win. Um, uh, I want to thank everyone who's helped make tonight happen. It's a lot of people. So it's Anna Harvey and the team at HarperCollins. <laughs> the Agatha Christie Estate. The British Library and the Literary Salon team. So thank you to all of you as well for being here tonight and to my guests, Kate Moss, Ella Bertou and Lucy Foley and of course Miss Marple and Dame Agatha Christie. Good night.